before. We're a volunteer-based community-run organisation. Uh, our idea is to create a space like this where we can come together as a community and learn from people within our community like Patrick who have a lot of knowledge about a certain area and then bring our own ideas and experiences and knowledge to bear in what's usually this, this is weird. What's usually a really open and vibrant discussion. What that means in practice is that after Patrick finishes speaking this evening, you're welcome to ask questions, of course, but you're also welcome to respond in greater depth um, and also respond to one another. You don't just have to pose questions and you can bring new issues to the table. Patrick's going to speak for about 45 minutes, then we'll have about the same amount of time for discussion. We're really pleased to welcome Patrick back. He's one of our longest serving speakers <laughs> and community members at the MFU. Last time Patrick was here was... Uh, in relation to his co-author book um, about the art of free travel and Patrick tonight, is responding to some of the debates that have been floating around and sort of popping up in the media about whether permaculture is culturally appropriative and so on. So lots to talk about this evening. Uh, we've still got some room inside, so if you guys want to come through, this, we can put some more people over here. So if everyone's comfortable, I'm going to hand over to Patrick. Okay, thanks. Okay. Thanks, Jasmine. Thank you so much for coming, everybody. Um, before I start, um, I wondered whether you would join me to do a little bit of um, vocal cord stretching. Do <laughs> we have any speech pathologists in the house? <coughs> no, I did it before, on the tram. People thought I was strange. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd like to acknowledge um, the meeting on Wurundjeri people's country, um, the Kulin Nation, and that uh, where I dwell and live with my family and community is Jajurung people's country, which is a, um, uh, a relative of a Kulin Nation, uh, up in the southern reaches of Jajurung country in Dalesford, um, <clears throat> where I moved uh, from country New South Wales uh, when I was 25. Um, to a very depressed, uh, economically, um, monetarily depressed town, but a vibrant arts, agriculture, <laughs> gay and lesbian community, um, and many other communities, um, much more than human. You can tell that I've been <clears throat> doing my uh, vocal cord warm up on the tram because I, I think I um, overextended myself. <laughs> it was a busy tram and I couldn't hear myself. Um, so, uh, today's talk is partly um, a response to um, some good uh, discussion around permaculture and cultural appropriation, um, some quite productive uh, uh, conversations in the last uh, few years about um, whether uh, it's appropriate to use terms like neo-peasantry or neo-peasant economies, um, which my partner, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> my partner Meg and I have been advancing, I suppose, for the last few years, um, having sort of fallen, it claiming us that term, um, as we were, I guess, eight or so years, maybe seven or eight years down our permaculture transition. Um, which is, for us, a transition from 100% uh, dependency on the global monetary economy to, um, 10 years later, um, today, just about 30% dependent. Um, so in that transition somewhere, uh, I guess, um, actually pretty early on, um, I'd say pretty much after I, I landed in Dalesford um, in my Kingswood um, sedan and rocked up at the Trentham Hotel and um, introduced myself to a few of the cricket, cricketers at the bar and said, um, did any of you have any work? And um, the response was, can you play cricket? And, <laughs> and I had left um, school and school co competitive sports long, long behind, but my way into the community was through smashing stumps with my right arm quick boldly. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I worked as a labourer, a builder, 
and um, have been building and learning uh, lots of pragmatic skills um, that um, my, uh, yeah, for, for the last, I guess, 20-odd 20, 20 years. Um, putting into practices, uh, uh, um, or putting into practice uh, knowledges, old knowledges, I suppose, uh, of self-provisioning and community provisioning. So lots of different skills through necessity, through um, not having much industries up in, in Dale, so particularly in, in the depressed 90s. Um, and yeah, slowly building knowledges passed on by very generous older folk, um, old, forest, old foresters teaching me how to fall a tree and slab it um, with a chainsaw and build, and then build um, traditional gates from, um, to knowledges around um, growing food and propagating plants to quite radical acts of um, guerrilla grafting and community gardening. Um, so I've always had a political interest. Um, I uh, grew up in, um, in, in, in the southern highlands of New South Wales um, and had uh, very um, working class parents, a grandmother who I uh, hold very dear, um, who I probably uh, uh, connect to or reach out to as my sort of the remnants of my um, peasant um, knowledges. My grandmother taught us kids to um, let a, a healthy dog um, lick your wounds. And I hold that as uh, old ancestry and medicine <coughs> passed down. But there has been great severage in, in my um, ancestry, in t um, severage from those old stories and those old life ways. And I suppose in the last 10 years, looking at the incredible complexes of uh, living <coughs> within the times that we do, um, slowly responding to each of the, uh, the big, I guess, ticket items of our culture, education, um, energy resources, food resources, um, community, and of course, um, more than human um, uh, life, ecologies, biomes. So um, I studied fine arts in Sydney. Uh, I set out to be a painter, and I ended up being a poet and um, working on a building site. And all the way along, um, accruing little bits of knowledges from older people, um, some from Aboriginal people, Jaujurong elders, some from my own elders, um, and people in the town. Um, so, yeah, about 10 years ago, I started reading David Holmgren's work. Um, he's a, a, a community friend or a, a family friend um, now. I didn't, when I first moved to Dalesford, I didn't know what Sue and David were doing down at Hepburn. They started there, I think, about 30 years ago. So I arrived five years later, and it took a long, long time to find them, even though they're four k's down the road. Um, so David's work, um, for someone who completely failed science and headed down the, the route of, of arts, um, David's work led me to a doctorate in, in the area I guess is um, regarded as the ecological humanities. And so, um, my love of plants and uh, autonomous life um, was developed as a child who was allowed to run down by the creek and through the blackberries and into the honeysuckles and uh, throwing rocks at neighbours and brothers and sisters and retrieving balls that ended up in the creek and um, swimming in muddy hollows and um, basically being outside of the watchful eye of, of parents, which is a, a, a rare thing um, these days. So um, all that sort of rat baggery, child-like exploration down by the creek, unsupervised, um, was dangerous and people got hurt and people got muddy and microbes were given over and, um, and 
and uh, life was claimed by children. So th that, I guess, was my science education. Um, that was my biome education. Um, but reading David's work, his um, Permaculture Pathways book, was the first time um, I really read a science book. So um, uh, some people, maybe even in this room, um, may not call permaculture a true science um, because it's linked to um, activism. Um, it's linked to um, <coughs> a whole range of subjects, really, social anthropology, economy, uh, ecology, of course, education, the way we live, ancestral stories, um, so many things. And science, um, generally, after the Enlightenment, um, is all about reductive areas of specialization. Until ca chaos theory. Thank God for chaos theory. Um, so, yeah, I, my, um, my road to permaculture um, has been a joyous one. It took me from being an angry young man, um, wanting change, wanting to uh, attack <laughs> the powers that be, to um, living my politic and living um, uh, my ecologic, if you like. Um, so, little by little, um, the, uh, the understandings around permaculture as, a, as applied ecology um, naturally grew into interests around economy and ecological economy. And I started to look at uh, all the different um, voicings of that term and found a lot of um, things that I guess you could consider as taming capitalism, and none of them really rubbed with me. I, I just, um, there's a lot of, you know, quite, I, I, all the sophisticated Scandinavian countries that we say, oh, they're doing such great things um, with uh, childcare and uh, social welfare and social justice, um, and they certainly are um, compared to Australia, but I, I started to develop a, um, a return to a, a childhood scepticism I had of money, and um, which is really interesting because the grandmother that used to tell me to um, uh, let let the dog lick a cut on my knee um, and get over that and enjoy that and understand that, also said you're going to be the wealthy one of the family, which I find um, amusing today. I'm certainly um, the wealthiest in my family in terms of time, and, um, but not money. Um, so, uh, yeah, so as, as I was reading permaculture, um, I was also developing uh, what I think is still a very healthy scepticism about money economies and, and growth economies, and starting to really develop a, a theory um, for why monetary economies or capitalism as a, as a necessary economy of growth is so problematic. And while you know, many people um, in this room um, have no doubt arrived at similar places, I want to just talk about um, what I mean by ecological economy and what I mean about the problems of money for a minute. So um, any system of economy that um, must continue to extract um, <clears throat> and not make returns to me is, is, a pro is a problem. The fact that on the right we have um, what we call progress pundits, what I call progress pundits, the uh, idea that um, culture economy is, is linear, it only gets better. I think Steven Pinker is the sort of the, the progress pundit of the year. Um, if anyone has been following his work. He's written a book called Enlightenment Now, a revisionist um, glorification of the Enlightenment and, and early um, capitalism. Um, and then on the, the left of politics, you have progressive progressives, um, which to me seems to be um, 
a similar, well, it's a similar thing. It's based on um, a linear direction, not a cyclical one. Um, and in a way, I think the left is uh, really drawing on the wealth of the progress pundits um, in order to pay for its progressiveness. And so um, I think that's a, that's a deep structural problem for me with economy, with the economies of left and right, of progress and progressiveness. Um, this is how the term neo-peasantry claimed me. Because um, having been very interested in Aboriginal culture and story for most of my adult life, um, and have lived with Aboriginal people and learned from Aboriginal people, it kept, I kept coming back to the same problem that these are not my stories, this is not my culture to tell. It is my, it, th these are cultures to listen to not to disappear, um, but these are not, this is not my culture, it's not my economy to tell. But at the same time, being incredibly aware that judge a wrong economy makes judge a wrong culture, and that just like all economies make culture, they provide the means for culture making to take place. So, um, but on the big trip that Meg and I and our two boys and our dog, Zero, took to Cape York and back, we were on a bikes, um, push bikes for 400 days up the east coast of Australia and return to Dalesford um, between 2.13 and 2.15. And um, what I came back from that trip realising, understanding that I have old people too. I have ancestors that, um, that were embedded in what I call land intelligence, that um, knew the cycles of life, that knew the seasons of life through foraging, through hunting, through snaring, through fishing. You, because I've been practicing these things for nearly a decade, the ecological knowledge and understanding you attain through hunting, snaring, fishing, hunting for mushrooms, foraging wild weeds, is, um, is understood. And so my connection to Jaju Rong economy and culture is from a natural interest in those things, in, in making autonomous species a part of one's economy um, in order to say no to the dominant economy or the, the supermarket um, or industrial agriculture. To have a relationship with weeds and ferals is to have a relationship with oneself. That's where I've arrived at. And the weeds and ferals, many of which are my ancestral foods, my ancestors' medicine foods, such as the hawthorn, um, the hawthorn berry, is um, antioxidant, high in vitamin C, um, by my indigenous ancestors um, would make hawthorn fruit leathers and put them in their pouches to get them through the long winters. Um, so the hawthorn has emplaced, I know that's a provocative word, but has emplaced and is emplacing and into becoming on Jaja Rong country. And the hawthorn tree um, the hawthorn trees around me are now the dominant habitat tree for the ringtail possum. <coughs> so over the last six months I've been um, writing uh, a chapter for a book that's coming out in the States next year called, and my chapter is called The Possum Thorn. And it looks at the, the relationship of the hawthorn and, uh, and the ringtail possum and how the, the economies of those two species have come together in, in pragmatic mutualism, not through some moral um, altruism, but pragmatic mutualism of adaptation and um, resilience. So the possum returns nutrients to the, to the tree by virtue of the fact that the tree is the possum's um, home, and the tree provides protection um, 
to the uh, ringtail possum that gets predated by powerful owls. Powerful owls eat about 300 possums a year. So that's nearly one every 40 hours. Um, so the, the thorny, dense, prickly, skin bletting, or um, blood letting, I should say, skin bletting. That's like a meddler, meddler reference. <clears throat> I've been eating a lot of med meddlers lately. Um, yeah, the skin, um, the blood letting, um, uh, power of, of the thorn, the sharpness of the thorn um, offers uh, protection for the ringtail possum. So this relationship um, makes me understand my own emplacement and my own connection to um, living on Jajurong country as not coming from that heritage. Um, the autonomous species around us, such as rabbits, foxes, hawthorns, blackberries, um, my ancestral spirit animals um, are shot, gassed, poisoned, have no ecological status whatsoever, and yet my own species has more ecological status than anybody else, and I find that deeply problematic. That conservation in Australia is mainly from a non-Indigenous perspective is so, um, well, only from a non-Indigenous perspective, is so fascistic, in my opinion, to sterilise, to gas, to poison, to kill en masse animals that don't have ecological status is a form of fascism. Um, Arian Wallach from the University of Technology in Sydney is advancing the term um, compassionate conservationism, and I really uh, urge you to check her and other people's work out like that, who are really um, asking very timely questions of what conservation is in Australia at the moment. Because to me, as a forager, as someone who works uh, in what I call a commons, um, in public land as a gorilla um, forest manager, um, it seems that the big giant chemical companies are cleaning up and um, not much is happening in terms of weed and feral mitigation. So that's a, a story that um, dovetails very um, uh, closely into this, uh, what I'm presenting here, I suppose, as, as an alternative economy. Not to say that neo-peasantry, not to say neo-peasant economy is the answer, to the solution to the problem by any means. This is just a personal response a personal um, claiming, it's, it's not to advance this as a replacement. Um, but certainly um, a way of telling uh, a story around the possibilities for alternative economy, the, the possibilities to imagine other economies that are not extractive, that, are, that make returns, that, um, that are both progressive and recessive. Um, and in that economising, where birth, growth and consumption, in a, in a linear extractive economy, birth, youth, growth, consumption, are foregrounded and death and decomposition, um, decay, are sidelined. Um, so, I mean, I think while some of the stuff, material I'm bringing tonight is quite contentious and provocative and, and um, may need some um, some good, robust um, discussion um, in a little while. Um, I think there may be um, consensus that we live in a society that um, degrades death and decomposition and foregrounds youth consumption and growth. Um, that's the way I read the dominant economy anyway. So how are we to think about economy that both progresses and um, redistributes, redresses, uh, regresses, um, because that economy is going to, in my opinion, or those economies, those many forms of economy that both honour death and decay and foreground birth and consumption and growth, um, that we don't live with reductive economy, that we live past reductive economy by, by actually um, 
taking on board these concepts into our own homes and community, community economies. And I think that's the great influence I've had from David Holmgren is not just his applied ecology, but <clears throat> talking up the possibility of the household and community economies for community sufficiency. I think too often um, peasant and certainly neo-peasant uh, economies are, are um, sidelined or critiqued as being um, self-sufficient. I don't believe any peasant or um, neo-peasant economy um, uh, is, is self-sufficient. It's always community sufficient. There is always the, uh, the flow of gifts between trusted neighbours, friends, community members, um, sometimes registered, quite often registered in some sort of formal arrangement, but with really close trusted kin, um, an unregistered flow of gifts. And so I might just talk, I've talked some abstracts here, I might just sort of ground it in some stories of home. Um, so I live on stolen land. I live on a quarter acre of Jajurong country. I have, a, with my uh, partner Meg, have a, a, a mortgage that sits within that big global monetary um, um, <laughs> economy. Um, and that we service that as rent or as our land tenure to grow another form of economy upon that. So um, about 11 years ago when 40-something-year-olds uh, could um, scrape the money together to buy something in Dalesford, um, was still possible. Unfortunately, it's not anymore, and there's changing our town very radically because of that. We're having a massive drain of young people. We're also responding to it in creative ways. And um, I've just recently set up um, Landshare Central Victoria um, as a website page to um, try to connect people who have access to land with people who don't have access to land. So if you're interested in um, Central Victoria and you've, you have a, a, a wish list, just find that site and, um, and start a conversation. So on that quarter acre, Meg, Woody, Zeph, when he lived with us, he currently doesn't live with us, he's in Melbourne now. Uh, our little dog, Jack Russell, uh, little Jack Russell dog, zero. Um, <clears throat> and then multiple others that come and live with us, usually people in their 20s who are coming in a non-monetary sense to live with us and learn um, I guess permaculture living skills. Um, we're just setting up the first permaculture living course. Um, we've got three courses coming up in spring. Um, three people at a time. Um, applications for that are open until mid-year. And you will, a, a, a day basically will start with wood collection either from the tip or from the nearby forest. There'll be forest work, planting work, um, blackberry um, uh, mitigation, not removal, but mitigation work, um, chopping and dropping of um, fuel loads so as uh, to stop CFA um, and other land managers going in and perennially burning that, sending lots of carbon up into the air, because this the forest that's just near us, which we call the commons, is um, currently well, it's on the southwest edge of town and it's um, fire hazardous to the town from that direction. So it has, it gets systematically burnt and systematically um, poisoned with herbicides. So to stop those cycles, um, we've uh, been doing guerrilla, guerrilla practices. Um, uh, basically, uh, neighbours, permaculture friends um, and uh, swaps that come to live with us. SWAP stands for social warming artists and permaculturalists. Um, uh, there's about 30 or 40 people, um, including the t-shirt here, who's um, worked down in that part of the world. Um, uh, many of our mushrooms, um, we forage, we teach foraging of mushrooms. Um, 
uh, at this time of the year, there's up to 30 species of wild mushrooms that we have now uh, accumulated on our list, about 50 wild, or 50 weed species. Um, uh, we will, um, bike maintenance is a part of the day, fermenting, um, storing um, food, gardening, um, biointensive gardening, um, keeping poultry, beekeeping, community gardening, um, uh, children's education. So I run a bush school uh, every Friday for kids from two up to uh, 10 at the moment. Um, so that's ecological literacy, um, teaching, uh, teaching kids uh, about what's actually going on in the forest, pointing out things like the possum thorn, um, about the newcomers and old timer species and the interrelationships and interbecomings that are happening in that forest. Um, and generally just living car free, living outside of um, supermarket food and um, uh, uh, living 70% uh, off the monetary grid, I suppose. Saving water, harvesting water, passively harvesting water, lots of different permaculture skills, um, humanure composting, um, uh, using uh, the scarce, or not the scarcity, but using the, the, um, the energy that we salvage from the tip or from um, being burnt in the forest really wisely, using, using that fuel to do about eight or nine different appliances worth of things for the one piece of wood. So, um, yeah, just uh, the <coughs> um, connection, I suppose, to ancestors. Um, when, when, when you look at the, um, the, uh, the enclosures began in feudal England around the 1200s, and, um, but more or less, uh, up until the 16th, early 1700s, um, many um, people, peasants and people of um, land or had access to common land in England could um, uh, augment their own economy and had up to a third of the year for festivals, rituals, seasonal um, uh, um, celebrations. And um, by the mid-1700s, so the mid-18th century, leading up until the end of the 18th century, classical political economy really got going. And many of those, um, uh, I guess, spruikers for the new economy um, saw to it that the commons was completely enclosed and fenced off to many people. And punitive laws were brought in, like the game laws that stopped peasants and um, country people from self-provisioning uh, in the woods with, with hunting, um, from foraging. And even the church um, oversaw um, the reporting of peasants staying at home on Sundays um, to grow a garden, to, um, to grow food. So um, things by the mid of the mid 1700s, things were getting pretty grim for rural people. Uh, it, it was very strategic. Um, the new industrialists needed factory fodder, and um, uh, while the enclosure started in feudal England, the um, Enclosure Act came in in 1773 um, through Parliament. Um, so that's pretty much the death knell to um, people being able to self-provision. This is the sucking in, the hoovering in of people into um, a dominant economy. Um, by 1776, three years later, um, Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations comes out. Um, 1778, Australia becomes a penal settlement. Um, there's a fantastic book called The Invention of Capitalism by um, Michael Perelman um, that has extraordinary detail into people like, I think it's Francis Hutchinson, um, Adam Smith's mentor, um, into letters, into documents that 
mainly have not been addressed by historians, showing the utter contempt for um, rural people, um, the utter contempt for people uh, who, were, who were called sloths and lazy for wanting to have a third of their year or working year off to celebrate the seasons, to celebrate the world and, and how the world uh, feeds their economy. So these are my ancestors in England. Um, uh, I do have Irish and German ancestors as well, but most, mostly in England. So Perlman's, Michael Perlman's book is really enlightening um, in terms of looking at how the feudal enclosures became the aggressive classical political economy enclosures that really triggered the need for the new world to <coughs> be dumped upon um, with the likes of many of us. Um, so, of course, uh, peasants were suckered into the cities, became extremely <laughs> impoverished, extremely unwell, extremely unhappy, and then by, by the mid-1700s. And these are the statistics, so this is the place where um, Stephen, Professor St Stephen Pinker's um, uh, figures begin when he shows how wonderful capitalism has been for people. All of these graphs start right in the heart of a completely fucked over peasantry. And those that were most likely the, the medical records of mortality rates, of uh, maternal mortality, infant man, man, um, mortality, life expectancy, etc., um, would have been recorded in the cities, in the industrial cities, in the big cities. They would not have gone out to where the remnants of the peasantry were hiding out. <laughs> That's probably an exaggeration, but were, you know, in the, in, further out, um, they would not have. Uh, they would not have had the resources to gather up how those people were doing health-wise. They would have taken their records from impo <coughs> impoverished people in the cities, in the impoverished, diseased, septic cities that had no life, that had no biology to make people well. So the early cities are, are of, of industrial England, um, uh, a squalor, sickness, alcoholism, all the, the typical things you see of dispossessed people. And I'm not at all trying to collapse my ancestry's dispossession as the same as indigenous dispossession in Australia. I think my ancestors were better off, a lot better off than Aboriginal people. Um, what was done to Aboriginal people in this country? However, there are, um, there are the same, the same bourgeois system of capital um, that uh, really saw to the death knell of peasantry of my old people, saw to the, um, the end of self-provisioning and community sufficiency, um, then was transported to Australia and to the so-called New World. Um, so this makes me feel extremely um, emotional about this. There is trauma around uh, there's, there's much uns uh, uh, the Australian poet Michael Farrell wrote a book called um, Australian Unsettlement. Um, I feel like Australian Unsettlement is a really worthy title of the culture in which we live. I don't want to live my entire life in the sickness of that unsettlement. I want to look at ways to create an economy, to ways to construct or create culture with loved folk that don't disappear, Jajuron people, that don't disappear my own indigenous <coughs> ancestry, that respects the, the stories and narratives of my old people who knew how to live a carbon positive economy and make carbon positive culture. Um, that is, I guess, a life's work. That's, um, that feels like important work for me to, to be doing. And 
Um, and important work to be sharing. Um, I probably said enough juicy stuff to, <laughs> to open it up, and I feel like I'm dominating the floor. So um, maybe we could go to question time. So we've got a lot of people in the room, um, so just to facilitate the discussion, uh, particularly for people who are sort of at the back edges, if you can't see the rest of the room, I might ask you to speak loudly um, in your comments. Um, so we'll open the floor. Go ahead, Kim. Um, yeah, thank you, Patrick. I thought that was a fantastic talk. Um, yeah, I was really interested in this this idea, I suppose, which is very much fermenting in the um, old right about that idea of the the how the white male has been like. Um, sort of put down by, by the culture. And so I thought this is a really brilliant take that you have um, where you are acknowledging these relationships, but intrinsically you're working towards this um, relationship that is so about, as you say, like the extra human. Um, and, and this is like this, it seems like that's the fundamental missing piece in, mm. in in the conversation both on the left and the right and, and it feels to me this is why um, for, for there, there is this sort of inability to understand these, um, these polarizing positions mm. and I, I just think it's really essential to be able to learn, to yes acknowledge of all these relationships that are mm. complex and intermingled so yeah, yeah no, thank you very much thank you, cheers Often um, permaculture, or permaculture, generally is accused of being a lifeboat mentality, whereas that if you're able to provision for yourself and to acquire these skills in terms of um, managing landscape, is that why do you? Because we spent some time together many years ago now, and it's sort of I've left your place and been out to the world <coughs> and, and sort of a what I assume or thought was a broader level because that's where I felt I needed to be mm -hmm. as opposed to beginning at the home site whereas where that's what permaculture is starting into a door and working out with. Mm -hmm. I just I just want to know like because you're still interested in the broader context so mm -hmm. why are you interested in the global perspective or even the city mm -hmm. if, if you know that you can <coughs> take care of yourself um yeah, I, I don't because of the of what's happened. Um, the genie, the imperialist genie, is out of the bottle. Um, we permaculturalists or anybody can't ignore the poli cannot ignore politics. My question kind of builds off <coughs> with the lifeboat kind of stuff. Um, so you kind of call for this, you know, uh, removal from a capitalist society. Which I like, you know, completely agree with. But where do you stand with using the resources that a capitalist society mm. um, allows to have them, like public transport, mm -hmm. roads, healthcare? Mm -hmm. Yeah. How do you like balance that? Yeah. Um, well, at this stage, as it, I've said, um, we're thirty percent uh, dependent on the monetary economy. We <laughs> hope, hope to get to about fifteen or twenty percent. Um, hospitals, in terms of public hospital, uh, we attend to that through the, the pharmacopoeia of um, the, f the food that we have. Like, obviously, I've put a chainsaw in my, in my leg and it was fantastic to have an emergency to go and s s sew it up. Um, but generally, uh, the dependency on the hospital system is because the food and um, the food system is so impoverished. Um, so I, I think a huge amount of human illness 
uh, and money towards human illness is based on the impoverishment of our food system. Um, if you have a look at, uh, say, the microbiome of Hadza people in Tanzania, where they eat around 600 species seasonally around the year, and look at their mortality rates, their microbiome diversity, uh, and compare that to someone who's living off the supermarket diet, there is a massive story to be told about that. So it's, it's not saying, I, I mean, I can't possibly see in my lifetime the wiping out of becoming totally moneyless. But by not having cars, not um, catching planes, um, growing our own food, foraging, um, uh, sharing skills that we're learning with others non-monetarily. We do some monetarily. We have house and garden tours that people pay for. Um, but, uh, and we do a few other workshops, but generally a lot of it is shared um, knowledge. Um, because the more we recognise the more people that know this knowledge, the more uh, non-monetary sharing that can go on. Um, yeah, so uh, I, I wouldn't mind if roads never got um, resurfaced again um, in my life. I, I think I just, uh, you know, I, I, the Dalesford tip has just hundreds and hundreds of old um, spare bike tyres. Um, and <laughs> they've got some really thick ones there. Um, public transport is awesome. <clears throat> um, but, you know, I think the way in which we're living uh, is not impoverishment. It's actually um, it's actually a, a wealth, a, a, a type of wealth that um, that I much prefer. Um, when I was a builder and I, I learned a whole lot of skills and then started hiring myself out as a builder, I was earning the most I ever earned and I was the most miserable I'd ever been. And I worked out, I think, by my late 30s that... Um, or mid-30s, that money, uh, I'm just going to fake chase my tail as a small business person. Um, the, the, the thing to do is to get access to land and to augment another economy that touches the earth lightly, that by getting rid of our two cars uh, seven, eight years ago meant that we didn't have to find, um, well, probably about $12,000 for those two cars because they're all bombs. But the average Australian car, according to the NRMA and the RACV figures, the average sized uh, Australian car costs around just under $15,000 a year with de depreciation, wear and tear, petrol, everything factored and then factored in. And then according to the Australian Bureau of Statistics, the average household has just over two cars per household. So that's thirty to thirty-five thousand dollars. That was like that slashed half of our, or more than half of our required income. I mean, you know, we're talking. Um, uh, as, as I said, our, our cars were more like combined twelve thousand dollars, six thousand each, or something a year. Um, but you know, uh, it, it slashed half, half half our income requirements. So, um, and then no car means you don't need. Um, roads uh, uh, to be repaired all the time. You don't have pothole issues. You don't have the need for, to build more and more roads because there's more and more people using cars. Um, so it's the same with supermarket. Um, the transportation or the distribution resources to move food around to people is the big story. I mean, food and energy resources are the big story of climate change. Our economy is the story of climate change, the way in which we extract and don't make any returns is the story of climate change. So I haven't even mentioned that story. Um, but the, I guess what we have found, we're responding to the, the complex predicaments of our time. How do we attend to our education needs of our children? Um, how do we, I mean, and to go back to that child that's sitting in the room now, that was able to go down by the creeks and get really muddy and to fall in love with plants. I, I was able to fall in love with plants because I didn't have parents chewing me off to some activity, to some school. Um, eventually I went to school. Um, and I'm grateful for that, uh, for, for a, a certain amount of the schooling. But um, the, the bush 
school kids. I think there's an evolutionary biologist called Peter Gray. He's got a couple of uh, TED Talks online. He talks about how children learn, how children teach themselves in the community of other children, um, in lots of different age groups, but how they self-learn. And you don't self-learn when you're impoverished and miserable and factory fodder in a street. That is why um, my, my peasant ancestors became working class people who were put down, were called uneducated, were called stupid. Um, they were, their, their the, where they were educated from, the land in which, what I call land intelligent cultures, where um, play, a, mam a mammalian, um, uh, you know, in automatic mammalian um, need for play is how we learn. Um, industrial schooling prepares us for an industrial economy. Um, so while you can learn useful things in an industrial school context, it's mainly um, preparing us to perpetuate um, an economy of extreme <coughs> destruction. Um, but children learn through play and by being let go along the creeks and the banks of wild spaces. And we are not going to ever have the hope of rebuilding an ecological economy unless our children can play in wild spaces again. I don't believe it's possible. There is such an ecological illiteracy or deficit in our culture. Um, and so a deficit of knowledge on what actually provides, makes life possible for us. How's that? How do we become a culture that completely ignores mycelium? Mycelium, which is the basis for soil production. And, and soil production is the basis for, for, for all life, including human life. And yet, I didn't learn that at school. I would have thought that would have been the absolutely the first and everyday lesson. <laughs> Come to school, kids. We have to tell you this story. Soil provides life. It's soil provides economy. Soil and the, the communities of life in that soil make life possible. It's like this is this is this is what's known through land-educated um, people. And people are educated by ecologies, as, as well as eldership, as well as mentorship, as well as humans holding those stories dear and keeping those stories forefront of the culture. But an extractive economy makes us extractors. It makes us see the world, see the natural world as externalities. I think that's the economic term for it. Thank you. Um, it's just about how, uh, in your position, how you uh, communicate um, with other people that aren't living your way of life in, in a compassionate way so you can not alienate others mm. into alienating yourself. Mm. Um, cause people to resent you and to create <coughs> vision. Mm -hmm. How do you? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, probably not go on social media. <laughs> uh, uh, um, we we can only we can only tell our story so far before becoming alienated from um, the rest of our community, um, let alone a broader society. Um, so we're we're held by. Um, the stories of others around us um, that make us reflect critically on our assumptions and our blind spots. I had a comment having uh, spent some time with you and I do follow you on social media because I know one of the things you are doing at the moment is IDing mushrooms at the local market. Yep. And I think so what I know of you that a lot of your interaction is in with the participants 
programs that you engage in, like with the community garden, um, and you sort of say, we're doing this, and it's always an invitation for people to join you, and it's not... Uh, mm. So it's a very welcoming... Mm. You go about doing your thing, <laughs> and it tends to be a very educational process, uh, and I know you're always interested in learning from other people, which is mm. part of what you get out of the spot experiences sure. and things like that. So I think, yeah, it's that mm. that you engage people by inviting them into what you do, which is also very community-based mm. um, in what you what you do. Does that answer your question a bit better, or yeah. or do you have another? Question from there? Yeah, I'm also getting into permaculture and getting into David Hungry's work. You're finding love, my, loved ones. <laughs> it's like, how do I, if I'm in, to continue that path, I feel a tension mm. rising between mm. how do I navigate like, my beliefs against mm. others? Yeah. If I still care and love deep if everyone else, but maybe I don't want to live the same yeah. way as them. Yeah. We have different values to have. Yeah. Or something. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. Just, just, just sure. Where are you about the possibility? Yeah. Um, yeah. At the same time, um, I mean, an example I'm going to give: we we had a um, a house tour recently, and uh, one partner dragged along the other, and then we got uh, an email, you know, excited email asking a whole lot more questions, mm. and said, but you know, my my partner really thinks you're, you know akin to Adolf Hitler because you don't let your boys wet, watch TV. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> right, <laughs> okay. So, you know, um, there's some pretty, you know, to, to, to us, that's, that's, a, that's a massive cultural gulf uh, that the uh, more permaculture proactive partner is sort of stepping between a partner that's way over there and us. Um, you know, I, some t I, I think yeah, I mean, you know, if those if that relationship was in our community, it would be worth fostering. If it's across the state and it's there's just you know there's only so many relationships we can have, and so that those sorts of things go through to the keeper. But I mean, having come from um, a family uh, where I'm the odd one out and the black sheep of the family, and all those sorts of cliches. Um, uh, you know, navigating relationships and trying again to engage with family members is, is definitely worthwhile. Um, we've got just behind you first and then come to you. Yeah. I'm quite interested kind of living in and having experienced two different kinds of economies. Where is there an overlap? The, like, are there things within the sort of mainstream economy that mm. we can that there is a shared value or we can embrace so that you can kind of emphasise these things so that this sort of new economies, whatever mm -hmm. they end up being, are not as radical. Because I think mm -hmm. radicalism is kind of scary and it's not very sure. appealing and it, sure. it's not relatable to a lot yeah. of people. So like, how do you make it relatable and what are the, yeah. uh, what are the similarities or the coexistences mm. of the two economies that we're talking about? There's a couple of things there. Um, We've got our mates Milkwood Permaculture, Kirsten and Nick, um, and they really, their whole <laughs> thing is uh, um, presenting permaculture and uh, alternative economy stuff in a much more um, uh, uh, broader, um, in broader terms and bringing on a lot more people. We, uh, we see, we, we come from the arts, so I, I come from poetry, so I'm used to speaking to small groups. I'm not actually into bigger narratives. I, I think the work that I, I'm doing is, is speaking um, amongst a radical core that's just as important as a mainstream um, response. It's, it's, just, it's just a, a personal thing. I think we need diverse economies and we need diverse cultural approaches to the predicament of our time. Uh, just, I, I celebrate difference and diversity. So, um, but I hear you, I, I hear, I think, um, the problematics of radicalism as well. And there's a limit in that, but there's a limit in every place that we choose to be, I suppose. 
Um, but it, the radicalism opens us up to being risky. To, we don't have a business that has to be safe. Uh, we're not uh, investing monetarily in the practice of artist as family and the practice of neo-peasantry. It's, it's almost like uh, a radical radicalization of the arts. I moved out of the arts through permaculture. Permaculture is a great exit strategy for, for the arts. Um, and, and really continued an art practice through neo-peasant permaculture um, as a performance, as an everyday performance. That's not going to sit well with mainstream Australia. I mean, people aren't interested in being artists or performance artists. They're interested in lots of different things. So, but, um, so, uh, so that's the first point. The second point um, uh, is, and I'm getting tired now because this is about two hours behind. Um, after my bedtime. <laughs> um, we haven't talked about blue light. And uh, <laughs> uh, we'll, we might get there. But, um, yeah, there was another point about that. Um, so, <laughs> maybe. Um, so you just made a comment then about performance and neo-peasantry. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm really troubled by the use of the word peasant mm -hmm. because... Peasants of the past and the peasants that live in the third world at the moment have absolutely no choice about their life. Mm. They have, they live in an extractive economy where their labour is the bit that's being extracted. Um, and what you're doing is a choice. Yeah. And so it makes a mockery of people who have no choice and are true peasants. Mm. How do you come to the word neo-peasantry? Mm. Okay. Um, I'll definitely address that. Can I just ask one more question? Um, which particular peasants are you talking about in terms uh, well, of... Well, I've, I've studied British peasants, Scottish peasants, Russian peasants. Mm -hmm. I um, do a fair bit of reading across the third world and, um, and the peasantry at mm -hmm. the moment in various countries. Mm -hmm. Like South American countries. South yeah. America, Africa, yep. Asia. Mm -hmm. There's yep. a fair few peasants in the world, but there's not too many in Australia. Mm -hmm. And you feel comfortable to speak on their behalf? I'm not speaking mm. on their behalf. I'm pointing out that your use of the word peasant for me is very troubling because mm -hmm. it's diminishing the people who actually have mm. no choice whatsoever about their life. I am, uh, thank you. But I'm definitely not calling myself a peasant. Um, the neo-peasant? Neo, neo locates the privilege for me. It locates it. It says this is coming from a place of choice. It just, it's, you know, neo is a, is a privileged word of his, so what history. What does peasant mean to you then? Um, well, I guess what my talk was based on is about reconnection to ancestry. So to, the, to that side of my family that I don't regard that modernity has severed. So that part of my ancestry that was peasant. Well, that would that, be all of us pretty well. I... I because I, we would all, there's I, the, the chances of any of us coming from an upper class um, yes, per, per it's very family low. is yes, very, very small, yes. given they were 1% of the community. Yeah, so, yeah. so the chances all of us, if we went that far enough, are going to find a peasant in our background. But I'm just, yeah. the way that yeah. you're using the word peasant is to denote something that is not, I mean, I understand living on land, I've got four acres myself, I understand all of that sort of stuff, but I'm really worrying about why the word peasant is in there. Okay, well, um, I guess it's, as, a, as I've said, um, it's a drawing on my ancestry. Um, I, I feel that if Palm Islanders who were displaced a uh, hundred years ago from all parts of uh, Queensland and dumped on the penal settlement of Palm Island mm -hmm. didn't transition to become the Balcomen people, which means people of many places, and reignite their indigeneity, even though they're away from their traditional lands. If they, if we were a culture that said those stories, the Balkman people don't exist. You are modernist people. You are you are subjects of industrial capital. That would be a gross violence onto them. I feel anyone that would, is saying that to myself as a neo peasant, calling myself that sincerely and deeply and honestly. Could I just, hold on, hold on. We've had, there's a couple of others who want to jump in at this point as well. I might throw to you for just, a second, thanks. and then we'll come back. I just back. want to continue on this thread. I mean, mm. I, don't, I hope I don't sound too critical here, but well, maybe that's fine. Um, why didn't you go back to England? 
do want to connect, connect with your ancestry. Go back to England. You, know, you, you, you bought private land in Australia to improve your life. That's a colonial gesture par excellence. Mm. Right? You want Hawthorne bush? Hawthorne bushes were introduced by settlers. It's not a name. Oh, right. I, I'm I know very, I'm all, I'm very sure well. I'm sure you're aware of this. I'm sure yeah. you're aware of this. So it's like, well, you know, mm. go back to England. Thing to sort of hear it's a question. That, hear that, um, that the call that I'm hearing here. It's like, um, we are here. How do we do it? Do we... There's so much to creatively reconfigure and work out how we can live with ourselves and how we can work out a new ethical way and you know there's every single one of us I imagine is living outside their morality on some level you know whether it's you know, how you get about how you eat how you clothe yourself and I I'm just so admire what you're doing which is saying I am here I um, yes, my, um, my blood ancestry is from somewhere else, but I don't want to continue that, um, that colonial project, which when you think about the span of human history is 0.01% of how humans have been in the world. It's this tiny, Dave Coleman talks about, you know, it's this huge little energy bubble that we've been in. We're climbing massively up and then we'll have a descent and then we'll go back to being some sort of, you could call it, peasantry or whatever, or, or not, you know, but it's hard, it's hard to know, of course. But how to, how to do this and how to work out, um, work, work creatively with the facts of, of our lives and the fact that we so desperately want to live in integrity and in um, relationship with, with where we've come from. And where we, where the beings that surround us. Eighty-five mm. percent of Australia lives in a city. Yes, like, that's right. That's a lot of people who actually choose not to do any of that stuff. Mm. Um, how do you actually make a decision? Mm. How do you make a decision? So, that? but the, mm. uh, that's what I'm saying. It's a choice, and I, I get is it a choice? People don't necessarily have a choice to live in a city. Mm. People gravitate towards cities as necessity. And, and as they always have, including the reason why lots and lots and lots of peasants left the countryside. They did it because that was their only choice. So that's right, and I see what Patrick is doing is trying to open up that choice again and say, you know, it was it was a, a forced it, you know, the clearances, I mean it was a very dramatic and very violent period in history. And his, it seems like you're excavating that moment and saying, well, how can we how can we, um, doing the best without violence, to find a way back to, if, to if we, most of human <laughs> life? 99.9% of human existence has not been in history, has not been vast populations with top down control. It just hasn't been. We're, we're only in cities um, because, as Mayor pointed out, because of fossil fuels. Only those sorts of figures is only because. Um, because of the availability of vast amounts of energy. Um, but just to pick up on a point, I'm not quite sure, I'm, I understand your argument, but I, I'll sort of draw it out a bit more, but I just wanted to respond um, to some of the um, discussion in the room. Um, I don't want modernity, I don't want the early or the classical political economists um, I don't want Adam Smith to sever my relationship with my ancestors. I, don't, I want to hold those stories close. I see uh, the story of dispossession, um, well, of, of Aboriginal dispossession, uh, very much caught up in my own um, geopolitical story. Um, my ancestors dispossessed Aboriginal people. They came when you become dispossessed, you become traumatised. You become, uh, as a per people, as a society, violent, um, dependent on substances, um, uh, desperate people. You don't make great culture out of that. We have been um, 
we are, we have been, many of us in this room have come from ruptured, probably all of us in this room have come from that rupturing of modernity, of early industrialization, and of early um, capitalism. If we hold on to that narrative and we want to stay in the shit of that narrative, then we will perpetuate the sort of economies that traumatised and disturbed people make. And that's what we're doing now. I'm saying I don't want to do that. And it might be foolish and it might be romantic and it might be some dude up in the country pretending to be something, but that's all I can do is not give in to the modernist story of severance to story. Well said. Did you have <laughs> Thank you. Tom, did you have your hand up for a question earlier? No, no, no. Just one other thing. No, we yeah, we'll come to you guys. Sorry, I thought there were questions there, but go ahead. Um, I was just wondering, um, so like, if we don't, you know, you're saying you don't want to give in to modernity, to capitalism, to colonialism, or to colonialism. Give in to their story. Give to the yeah. story. Yeah. Um, so you're holding your own clothes. Um, how, given that, like, not everyone in society, like, in, in Melbourne, um, shares that criticism of all those things, sure. how do you expect by just adopting it or realising it in your lifestyle that, and not, like, attacking the, or, like, highlighting the issues with the current system, yeah. like, that the, the story is actually going to spread enough to deal with the, the ecological issues? <laughs> yeah, I'm going to share what I do as a storyteller and, um, and, and not present that this is, for everybody, this is not the solution to the problem. This is a response to the predicament of our time. So I, I guess what I'm asking for is that many of us start to make responses that attend to the destructiveness of our past, um, the, dis the trauma of our own story, I think Mayer's work talks about hidden or buried trauma um, as a culture of entertainment, of constant distractions. The ghosts of violence and trauma can be disappeared at an uh, A-League match or uh, at a stadium or through alcohol or drugs, etc. But, um, yeah, I'm not sure if that answered your question or even partly attended to it. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I suppose maybe I'm thinking about it from a more of a reductionist sort of practical or like scientific perspective, just like given the, the you know, the, how bad like climate change is and the extremes which we're living in. Um, yeah, like, we, we don't necessarily need to become politicians, like if we organise um, to attack sort of those systems and highlight the issues of yeah. rather than, because, you know, going off grid and doing your own lifestyle thing takes up a lot of energy, like your own time and stuff. So I yeah. suppose like that's a popular thing to do in Australia, but um, what does that mean for our, our social media? See, it's, I think it's, yeah, okay, that's a good point. I, I understand now. Um, I think it's really important to, to differentiate between, say, self-provisioning, heading to the hills, getting your cellar, you know, building a bunker, uh, loading it with ammunition, and actually doing this in a community context. You know, one is inherently right-wing and self-centred and narcissistic and kiddled, and one is trying to re-engage in processes of circularity, of, of mentorship, of eldership, of initiation, rites of passage. So the reason why I'm, I teach the kids um, as a volunteer in the town, take them out into the, to the, the country, um, I'm in relationship with the Jajarong people. They are currently a uh, Jajarong corporation. They, they currently have two young Jajarong scholars rewriting their language book, and we've put in a request once that book is done to teach the, langu the first language of, this, of the old time species. And then I want to teach, I wish I had the old languages of my culture that I could teach of, of what the Hawthorne is. But the, the, what I have observed is there is a healing in many species that are performing um, mutualistic economies between 
um, plants and mushrooms and, um, and animals that are old timer and newcomers. And that is something worth watching. That's, that's, there's, um, there's economy worth listening to there. Um, so that, all of this, everything that we do is, is political in that sense. It, by not shopping at supermarkets for the last seven or eight years is, is probably the most political act I think someone can do. By not driving a car is, a, is one of the most heftiest political acts. Or, or not driving a car very often. Or not going to the supermarket very often. Or, you know, this has been 10 years of step by step um, taking power away, sharing that, taking power away from the systems of uh, domination. So from that, that take, uh, hoover up our money into the 1%. If, we, if, if there were 15% of us living low carbon, um, no supermarket, l low fossil fuel or no fossil fuel um, uh, <coughs> lifeways, you would topple the current economic system. You're not going to topple it by anger in the city. You're not going to do it. You're, gonna, you're going to you're going to topple the system by turning that anger into productive urban and suburban um, food systems. You're going to topple it by not handing over your cash to big, powerful um, uh, systems of abuse. And so it is deeply political what permaculture is doing, it's just written off in political terms as being proper politics. We've only got about five more minutes and we've <laughs> just got two people over here, so we'll take you one after the other. Go ahead. Yeah, you. And oh, then you're right. I was going to say, you seem really busy and I was just wondering if you've gotten to the stage yet where you have a third of your time for celebration or do you have to have a bigger community in order to get to that stage? <laughs> Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a great question. I always say if we were just living this way and not being political about it, i.e. not being activists, we would be, our working day would be about four hours a day. So it, we spend another four hours a day in the political side, in telling the story, in writing the story, in, in teaching the story. So... Um, yeah, we probably do 20 to 25 hours, or, or yeah, about, no, no, sorry, about 15 hours a week each, uh, Meg and I, so 30 hours a week community work. Um, and that's because we have the time to do that. We, you know, we're, we're not, like when I was a builder, I was just chasing my tail uh, and then indulging myself on the weekends. You know, like I need stuff for me. <laughs> so I would go to the cafe. <laughs> And, uh, and, you know, eat all this originless food. Um, so, uh, yeah, some of this uh, ceremony, uh, what we do in the winter, we've, got, we've built this really crude uh, um, sauna out of an old fire from the tip and some locally cut cedar. And on a Friday nights, um, we have a, a local food gathering. People bring all their produce from their garden. They lay it out on tables. We only have... Um, uh, a candlelight and then we have a sweat and so uh, while that would be awesome if that was on public land and we do lots of stuff like that on public land to build something sort of permanent like that on public land is a bit more problematic or a bit more uh, needs a lot more attention but certainly to garden and to forest um, to do forestry guerrilla forestry practices on public land is what we've been doing so that's those that are community gardening and community um, forestry is, is, you know, it's work, but it's celebration as well. It's social time. It's gathering. Um, it's having picnics and not, you know, working all the time. It's more social than it is work. Um, yeah. Lucky last. Uh, just to like address some of the things. Can you just a little bit louder? Yep. Um, I think it's sort of representative of like a broader problem in our society of polarizing between like left and right or to yeah. like hyper intellectualize things mm -hmm. and quick to criticize. Mm -hmm. 
And I was just wondering, I guess my question is like, well, do you think it's important that like a return to ecology and land to actually like to be able to think clearly and to reconnect with ourselves? Yeah, land or, I, like, I to, yes. To solve these problems in the city, in this intellectual context. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 I don't. I'm not. I'm not advancing that everyone like re-ruralizes. That's just way too simplistic. But I am certainly advancing reconnection with biomes, whether it be your skin biome, your mouth biome, your gut mi microbiomes. Um, we, we are walking wild ecologies ourselves. Just to get back to the city thing, I am a fundamental critic of the city. The c cities um, who really thinks that we can make ecological culture again when we live in a, a monospecies environment, except for a few pest species like rats and a few pets. You know, like, uh, uh, this is a recipe for lots of agro. I mean, so chemical problematics of young men, um, <laughs> uninitiated young men in the city, uh, the recipe for disaster. But yeah, I think um, the lack of ecological, the, the lack of um, uh, regard and listening to the call of others, of non-human others, is a big problem. And that's, that's inherently come from a gender lopsided patriarchal society that has diminished the chronic, the underworld, the uncertainty, the feminine. Uh, this is gender lopsidedness in action. This is why we have violence against women, violence against the land. This is why we have violence against each other in a, in a room um, of generally like-minded. I mean, uh, let's get together. Um, yeah. That's a nice note for us to end on tonight. Thank you again, Patrick.